I've had a few questions come through over the last couple of days asking, well, all pretty much asking the same question, which is what is my target weight for this cut? What is my ideal weight? I mean, I think those are two different things with a bit of nuance between them. Obviously, my ideal weight is what I would be weighing in in my dream physique, right? At whatever my best body fat percentage is and however much muscle mass I think I can peak at. And that's hard to predict. I mean, I've said I'd be happy at 95 kilos at 15% body fat. That's always a number that's in the back of my mind. But how realistic that's going to be, we'll have to wait and find out. I mean, I'm talking over a five, 10 year time frame here. So there's a long time to fulfill that potential. But yeah, we have to put in the work and see what we can achieve. I'm obviously not going to limit myself there or feel like a failure if I don't get there because ultimately I've just got to focus on the inputs, what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, make sure that I'm doing everything I can to progress ultimately. Now, in terms of this cut, what my weight goal is, that's hard to say because my goal is body fat percentage, not really weight. I'm targeting around 12% body fat. That's really, really what I want to hit. Last time, I think I got 13, 14% body fat. So I just want to get a bit leaner than I was last time. And by the end of the last cut, I weighed in at I think 84 and a half kg. So about three kilos lighter than I am now. But obviously I built more muscle during my bulk, but then also I want to get leaner than that. So it's hard to predict an exact weight. I put a range of, I think, 80 to 82 kg. I think that'll probably get me closer to the 10% body fat, but somewhere in that kind of ballpark, around the 82, 83 kg mark, that's probably the weight that I'm going to be expecting by the end of this cut, which is reasonable. I mean, we've got another, well, five weeks minimum to lose four kg. So, yeah, that's about... We're, we're pretty much on target, right? And I don't mind cutting for an extra week or two longer than that if it's going to mean that I get to that 12% or maybe slightly leaner body fat percentage and look my best ultimately. That's the goal. So, yeah, I've done my best to quantify it there, but I don't think that's important. I think with goal setting, you have to focus on the things that you can control. I don't think you should focus on the end. I mean, I think you should have some kind of end in mind so you know I said I was about to say what you'll be satisfied with but you're never really satisfied and that, that's ultimately why I don't like setting end goals I like focusing on inputs and short term goals what do I want to do in the next X number of months because your brain can process that easily whereas if you think what do I want to be in 5 years a lot changes in 5 years how many of your 5 year predictions have come true not a lot of them and if they have well then I would say that's probably more of a problem than a good thing, to be honest, because it means that you're not, your brain's not evolving, you're not learning, you're not growing, you're not changing your mind about things. I think that's very healthy to do that. Obviously, I think there's some things where it is just a function of time and you do just have to stick them out. Like, I want to get bigger and leaner when five years' time, obviously, I still want, I'm still going to want those same things. Probably. That could change, who knows? But I'm probably still going to want those same things. Whereas the career I wanted to do five years ago, well, I'm not doing that career now because that's not what I want to do now, right? My mind changed. So it depends on the context, obviously, but in the context of bodybuilding, obviously you're in it for the long term, but there's no time limit. It's not like after five years, you're just going to go, well, I achieved it, now I don't do anything. Obviously not, right? Even if you achieve your physique, you've still got to maintain that physique in some way. So you're always going to be training, you've always got to be eating well, you always got to be getting your sleep in, right? Obviously, you don't have to be as dialed in to maintain a physique compared to building a physique. But for long-term health, you still want to focus on those things, right? And also, it's just fun to train. <laughs> I just really enjoy training, especially at the moment. Again, that's one of the things that could change in the future. Who knows, right? My, my, my modality of training could completely change, right? I might get the urge to get faster or the urge to just really focus on my strength and my one rep maxes. But for now, bodybuilding is the focus and specifically cutting is the focus for the next month and a half or so. 
Today we're going to be, hopefully, training some chest, which I'm very much looking forward to. Probably my favorite session. Not that I don't like the other sessions. I love all my training sessions, really. There's never really a day where I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. I even enjoy leg day, which I know is rare among the lifting community. But there's just something magical about chest day. Just an inclined dumbbell press. It's kind of hard to top that. Anyway, I weighed in at 87.5 kg first thing this morning. So here's a little pre-workout physique check. This is how my chest is looking without any kind of pump. So you've got a point of reference for the post-workout pump, which hopefully will be looking pretty good. Anyway, without further ado, let's go and get some breakfast. So first up, I've got some scrambled eggs with avocado and baked potatoes. Then I've got some beef steaks with veggies and a sweet potato. Then I've got some bulk elevate pre-workout powder and some electrolytes. So I kicked off my chest day on the machine chest press because unfortunately the dumbbell area was ridiculously busy today. So getting on the incline dumbbell bench wasn't really an option, which isn't the end of the world because this is still a great chest building exercise and it still hits my upper chest effectively. Anyway, on my first set, I had 70 kilos on the stack where I managed nine reps. Then I lowered the weight for my second and third set down to 67 and a half kilos where I managed 10 reps and eight reps respectively. And then for my final set, I had 65 kilos on the stack and managed eight reps. Then I moved over to the peg deck machine where I was feeling much stronger than usual, probably because I didn't do any incline dumbbell pressing that was activating all the stabilizing muscles that come into play when you do a fly movement compared to a pressing movement when you're locked in with your range of motion on a machine. But either way, I managed 14 reps on my first set at 40 kilos, which is by far my personal best on this machine. And I specified this machine because I've used a lot of different peg decks and for some reason this one is just way heavier than all the others. I mean, a one that I used at Pure Gym, I could do the full stack of 130 kilos, no problem, could bang out eight reps at that weight. Whereas at my, at my gym with this peg deck machine, 40 kilos is pretty intense. Then I stayed at that weight for my final two sets where I managed 13 and 11 reps. Then it was time to head to the change rooms to check out the pump, which was looking pretty decent if I do say so myself really happy with how my chest definition is improving as we progress through this cut. Then I finished up the whole session with 30 minutes of cardio on the seated bike as per usual. And you can pause the video here if you wanna check out my sets, reps, and weights used throughout the lift. Then for my post-workout meal, I've got some chicken breast with veggies and a sweet potato. Then to finish up my eating for the day, I've got some Greek yogurt with creatine, protein powder, fruit, and nuts. And that concludes another pretty damn successful day of this cut. I'll put my calories and macros on screen for you. So just over 2,600 calories consumed once again. So in that target range and yeah, it's working. So I'm going to stick with that target. Well, for as long as possible, really. I mean, my last resort is to lower my calorie intake. I would rather increase the amount of cardio I'm doing before I even think about lowering my calories just because I find it easier to expend more energy rather than consume less energy that's just the way i work i know for some people it's easier to just use the diet as the key tool but for me that's never really worked so that's kind of my approach there anyway really solid chest day today even though we didn't get on the incline dumbbell bench which is a bit of a disappointment because it's probably my favorite exercise but my machine chest press sets were still pretty damn good and pretty damn intense i feel like you can definitely push yourself more on a machine compared to free weights just because you're kind of locked in on your range of motion and maybe the last rep there's a bit of cheating involved where you're really just giving it everything you've got you're leaning over a bit your postures go and your front delts are getting engaged just to crank out that final rep but i think that's fine because you're still getting a lot of chest activation there and you're hitting that point of absolute failure so you know that your chest has nothing left to give and you're stimulating it for hypertrophy which obviously we're not going to achieve a crazy amount of hypertrophy during this cut, but you want to be training as if you're tra still training to grow your muscles whilst cutting if you want to maintain those muscles, because otherwise your body has no reason to retain that muscle mass and you'll start to atrophy. So that's the reason that the training side of things doesn't really change whether you're cutting or bulking. The only change that I'll make to my training when I start bulking is doing more targeted sessions 
well, not, not more targeted sessions, but targeting specific muscle groups. So this bulk, I really want to target my arms and shoulders. So that means reducing the volume of all my other muscle groups down to maintenance and then going all out with my shoulders and arms to make sure that all of the calories that I'm consuming are going straight into my arms and shoulders. At least that's the bro science behind it. Obviously, it's not quite that simple, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. Now, I just read a comment, actually, that was really observant. I don't think most people look at the nutrient breakdown at the end of these videos. I mean, I don't think most people make it to the end of the videos, to be honest, but this guy had noticed that my vitamin D consumption was pretty high. It was 909% of the target that was set. Now, first of all, thank you to him for pointing that out because I wasn't really paying as much attention to it as I should have been. But also, the target was set to, I think, 600 IU. I forgot what IU stands for, but it's basically the units that you measure vitamin D and vitamin A in. They can be converted to like micrograms and things like that. Either way, 600 IU is the average, oh, sorry, it's the recommended daily dose of vitamin D. Now, that value is calculated based on the average person. And if you've ever looked into, for example, hydration, how much water you should be consuming, the average person should be consuming two liters. But of course, there's variation in that. Some people need less than that. Some people need way more than that. It depends on the biology of the person. So you can't just take average values for targets and go with them, right? There needs to be a bit more thought put into them. And I haven't done that. I haven't set all the targets in my chronometer app, but I need to do that. That's something I'm going to work on over the next week, just trying to figure out what some some better targets are for me for each of my micronutrients. Now, obviously, 909%, what does that equate to then if my target is 600? Well, for example, today I had 5,200 IU or something like that, vitamin D, and that is too much. That is way too much that does run the risk of encountering health problems down the line. So we want to avoid that, obviously. So I'm going to be reducing my dose. I was, for some reason, I was still taking an extra vitamin D free tablet that I started taking ages ago. And I just never took it out of my supplement protocol, but I'm definitely going to cut back on that. And that should put us into a much healthier range for vitamin D intake. And yeah, if I need to make further adjustments, I will, obviously. And yeah, I'm just going to go through some of my other macro and micronutrient targets and make sure, well, they're set to reasonable goals for me. That's ultimately what we're trying to do here. Adapting the literature to the individual, which is always hard to do. But luckily, there are some people much smarter than me out there who put formulas together to figure these things out. So I'm sure they'll be able to find a formula online that will calculate the optimal amount of vitamin D at my height, weight, muscle mass, etc., etc. right? or the optimal amount of omega-3 fatty acids at my weight, height, blah, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not just going to keep repeating myself, but you get the point. You can plug in your values the same way that you can calculate your totally, total daily energy, energy expenditure. Can't talk at the moment. T-D-E-E, -E, right? You probably used one of those calculators before, and it takes all of those things into consideration. And you want the same for your macro and micronutrients as well. You want to know how much you should be taking, not how much the average person should be taking because the average person just doesn't apply to most people. It's not the mode, it's the meat, it's the mean, right? So the mean is obviously the average, the mode is the most common. And even the mode is pretty useless here because you've got outliers and because the world's population is 8 billion, you literally have millions of people in those extreme outlier sections. And even for most people, right? they're not going to fall into the average ranges. So yeah, I think those metrics are ultimately pretty useless, but they can be a good starting point. If you know what the average person's weight and height is, then you can scale that up, right? So it's not completely useless, but yeah, national health organizations are just a little bit slow at updating these kind of things and raising awareness about these kind of things because ultimately most people are probably vitamin D deficient. So they're just trying to get people to consume at least 600 IU because that would, that would be better than what they're consuming at the moment. Anyway, tomorrow is going to be a back session. So hopefully I will see you there for it. Cheers.